Good morning again. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to our webinar. Home Fire Sprinkler Developer Incentives, Reducing Construction Costs and Improving Community Safety in North Carolina. I'm Lorraine Carley from the National Fire Protection Association and president of the Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition. Our speakers today will be Brian Taylor, Chief State Fire Marshal from the North Carolina Office of State Fire Marshal, Mike Causey, Commissioner, North Carolina Department of Insurance, Gary Keith, Field Manager for the Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition, and Charlie Johnson, Chair of the North Carolina Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition and Chief Fire Code Consultant with the North Carolina Office of State Fire Marshal. Later in our program, Kelly Ransdell will be handling our Q&A. Originally, this was supposed to be an in-person lunch and learn. Since it's now a webinar, lunch is on us. For those from Wake, Hartnett and Chatham County areas who stay with us through the completion of the program and fill out the evaluation, we'll send you a $10 Smithfield's chicken and barbecue gift card. So that's pretty good incentive. Uh, the link to the evaluation will be posted in the chat. At the end of the presentation, the panelists will participate in a question and answer session. Please use the Q&A for this portion of the program. The chat can be used to share links, resources, or anything except the questions. Now I'd like to invite Brian Taylor, Chief State Fire Marshal, to say a few words and introduce Commissioner Causey. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to those also from out of North Carolina. Uh, weather is pretty here. I hope it is where you are, but um, thank you for all uh, for being on this today and uh, Carly and um, of course Peg and, and Kelly, all the NFPA staff and the home fire sprinkler group and uh, of course Charlie Johnson, one of our own. Uh, Charlie chairs the North Carolina Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition and, and we are excited about the work that uh, he and the committee has, has been doing uh, alongside of Shannon Bullock and, and her team. Uh, a lot of great work. I can tell you working legislatively and going throughout the state of North Carolina with the commissioner, we hear a lot talk about the incentives and, and alternative methods. But once you start speaking about sprinklers, it kind of, they drop their head, but it is the, uh, what the future holds. A lot of these developments, how can we get around two interests and things of that nature? Commissioner and I spoke with a legislator this week and he has a, a big initiative in the Pinehurst area, which for home fire sprinklers, that's the home of, of our home fire sprinklers in North Carolina um, over, over many years. But um, no need for me to continue talking. Uh, the next um, speaker, uh, I have the honor to serve uh, appointed uh, by the commissioner to oversee the Office of State Fire Marshal. I have traveled this state for four years. Uh, he's done great work through the state, uh, make us, made us more accessible, user-friendly um, throughout the state, if it's from fire rescue side um, to engineering and codes. Uh, making those partnerships and relationships are key, but uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce your state fire marshal insurance commissioner of North Carolina, Mike Causey. Thank you, Brian. Keep talking. You were on a roll there. I like that. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I want to thank the uh, North Carolina Home Sprinkler Coalition. Uh, and the National Fire Sprinkler Association for all you've done, and especially giving us the fire sprinkler tra trailer three years ago, that's been a big help to us. Uh, I was on a, a TV interview earlier today with a, a Latino uh, television station uh, talking about this very issue about fire safety. We're approaching uh, Thanksgiving, and soon Christmas holidays. And you know, every year when the weather turns cold, holiday season, we start seeing those fires. And we had, uh, some of you may have seen, we, we had a three month old child die in a house fire this past week. So these are tragedies that could be prevented uh, with the right education and uh, you know, automatic sprinklers have been around a long time since the late uh, 1800s, I think 1874s 
when we had the first automatic sprinkler. But uh, everywhere I go, I'm talking about what uh, our fire departments, our volunteer fire departments do to uh, promote fire safety. And uh, we just need to continue that because uh, as some of you know, three, two, two years ago, we had 138 people die in home fires in North Carolina. Last year, it dropped down a little bit, it's still way too high to 118. And I think we're approaching 100 already this year. So uh, we've been talking about the dangers of the turkey fryers, the deep fryers, uh, unattended cooking, the space heaters, all of those things have, have come into to play in our conversations. But uh, we've seen through a lot of live demonstrations that I've participated in the value of the home sprinklers and how uh, with the materials we have today, uh, somebody drops a match or drops something in a trash can to, to start a fire, that whole room is up in flames in less than two minutes. So we've seen demonstrations that show what happens in that room when there's no sprinklers versus what happens when there is a sprinkler system uh, in dorm rooms or other rooms. So uh, I just applaud the efforts of, of what you all are doing to uh, educate the public and our legislators. And if there's anything we can do from the Office of State Fire Marshal or the Department of Insurance, uh, we're here to help. And uh, thank you for having me and thank you for what you're doing today. Thank you both for being with us this morning and, and thank you for all of the work that you do in North Carolina to improve fire safety. We really appreciate the efforts of, of Commissioner and your entire team. And this is a great collaboration this morning and we're happy to be with you. Thank you. All right, so the, let me dive back in here. The Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition is the leading resource for independent non-commercial information about the life-saving benefits of home fire sprinklers in one in two families. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're going to hone in on one in two families. Uh, the mission is to save lives by increasing awareness of the benefits and availability of home fire sprinklers ultimately increasing the number of installations in new one and two family homes. So getting more homes protected with this life-saving technology. Uh, I thought the commissioner did a great job of framing this issue in the North Carolina uh, with those statistics and really um, talking about more than a hundred deaths a year in, in fires in North Carolina. So let me frame our discussion uh, on why this program is important for residents and first responders. The fire problem today is in homes. There is one fatality in a US home fire about every three hours. 65% of the fire deaths we see in the United States are happening at home and 8,800 civilian injuries and uh, a staggering over $6 billion in direct property damage. These numbers are incredible, um, but we can do something about these. Today's home fires are also more dangerous for firefighters. A firefighter is 11 times more likely to be injured fighting a structure fire. And 67% of firefighter injuries are from fighting structure fires. Now, there's been some recent research. Cancer is an enormous issue in the fire service today as we learn more and more about the impact of fire and smoke on first responders. This research revealed that they face a 9% increase in cancer diagnosis and a 14% increase in cancer-related deaths compared to the general population in the U.S. Now, home fire death rates have increased. Although we have seen um, pretty good success in the number of fires and fire deaths going down significantly since the 1980s, there are some statistics today that are very troubling. 
In 2019, the death rate per 1,000 reported home fires in one and two family homes was 27% higher than the death rate in home fires overall in 1980. One of the most dramatic statistics that I often talk about is that if you have a reported home fire today, you are more likely to die than you were 40 years ago. And that is really the crux of what we're gonna be talking about today. These statistics underscore the problem, but as you'll hear, we can build safer communities and also reduce the cost of construction. So I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Gary Keith to go over the details of how we can do this. Gary? Thanks Lorraine and good morning everybody. Thanks for joining us as we uh, get into this issue um, and talk about uh, a little bit about sprinklers in general. Um, don't mean to turn this into a sprinkler course per se, but for you to get a little bit of the basics and then talk specifically about the incentives. So uh, Lorraine talked about the statistics and the fact that the fire problem is in the home. And here are a couple of reasons for that. Um, in new construction, we see a lot with pre-engineered um, framing as opposed to the traditional dimensional lumber. Uh, and that material is very strong in a non-fire situation, very stable um, and good material to use. But when it's subject or exposed to fire, um, it fails quicker and, and often collapses and uh, resulting in um, very early destruction and making it challenging for occupants to escape uh, and making it difficult for the firefighters to gain entry and uh, to extinguish the fire. Uh, larger, more open designs um, enable flashover to occur more quickly. Um, and the other problem, uh, the, the synthetics, and this, this isn't limited to new houses, this is in all types of homes, that uh, these synthetics burn faster, hotter, and produce toxic deadly smoke, uh, again, or respond to health hazard as Lorraine talked about with the cancer issue. So the two minutes is a, um, is a good figure to be thinking about in terms of uh, today's uh, home fires and how quickly they become deadly. And you're gonna see that here shortly. So we talk about sprinklers, 89% um, of the time, just one sprinkler operates. And again, this is one of the big myths uh, that are out there in terms of uh, the fact that um, it just the sprinkler closest to the fire operates, not what you see in Hollywood or television. Um, and fires were kept to the room of origin 97% of, of the time. So again, uh, we only would expect um, you know, one, maybe two sprinklers to, um, at the most to, to control or even extinguish a fire. And the risk of dying in a home fire decreases by about 85% if sprinklers are present. So you combine that with smoke alarms uh, and you're really reducing the likelihood of becoming a fire victim. As far as how sprinklers operate, oh, sorry, Peg, just back a minute so I can. <laughs> I was just going to cover the components there. Yeah, thank you, Peg. Um, so just a couple of uh, quick um, highlights on the components of a sprinkler system. Um, the piping, for the most part, is uh, CPVC plastic. So a little different than the traditional plumbing plastic, which is usually white, regular PVC. Uh, it's the uh, orange is usually what it comes in. Um, you can also have PEX uh, plumbing, um, combined plumbing sprinkler systems, uh, and, um, and that works well. That's um, allowed within the standard. Um, the sprinkler head itself, um, we have a, a bulb, uh, which is rated usually between 135 and 65, a glass bulb with a liquid with an air bubble in there. That's heat sensitive. If we have a concealed sprinkler like shown here, which is very popular in residential settings, you have a plate below that that it's also heat sensitive and has a temperature rating slightly below what the, what the bulb temperature is. So that plate will activate first, the plate will drop, uh, and the head will then be exposed to the, uh, the element in the head will be exposed to the, um, uh, to the fire and will uh, operate. So um, the benefits, as I said, um, we, we expect to see just one sprinkler in most cases. Um, you know, we, we, we get extinguishment a lot, but the primary objective is control. Get, let's control that fire, maintain the exit pathway for occupants as a life safety system, uh, maintain control of that fire till the fire department arrives and ensures uh, final extinguishment. Um, you know, this is a big issue. Um, we need to protect those that are at high risk. You know, in this country, we've seen uh, in the last 30 years, great expansion in the usage and the capabilities of smoke alarms. And smoke alarms are essential. Um, but smoke alarms often cannot protect 
the very young, the very old, and people with disabilities. Um, you can have all types of smoke alarms going off, and if those uh, individuals in those categories are not able to escape on their own, um, then they still may become victims of fire. And sprinklers provide that level of extra benefit, extra protection uh, to protect those occupants. I have a, an example myself when I was, I retrofitted my home about 20 years ago, and um, you may be able to see one of the sprinklers, um, you know, behind me. And um, when we were doing the final installation and I had the rough end of the pipe, but it was not connected at 1.30 in the morning, we had a smoke alarm, faulty smoke alarm go off, um, interconnected. Uh, my kids at the time were all under 10 years old and not one of them woke up. And uh, that to me proved the, the uh, benefit of what I was doing with uh, retrofitting my home with sprinklers. And the other thing is we've talked about already uh, protecting firefighters from exposure, which can lead to uh, cancer and other health concerns. All right, so uh, let me set this up a little bit. Some of you, especially those of you in the fire service may have seen this video. Um, we have the permission of the family to use this footage. This is a, a house fire that occurred in the Denver area. Um, and what you're going to see is a home security camera uh, focused on an elderly gentleman that's uh, by, by himself in a living room. And um, you can hear the chatter of the other family members. There's a birthday celebration going on. And um, you can, um, you'll see, see a fire development on the fire develop on the left hand side of the screen. And, um, and it's just interesting to watch the reaction and to think about what would have happened if uh, that gentleman was there by himself. Um, and it really shows how quickly a, a fire development the fire develops. If we had been live, uh, like we had attended, intended to do with this last spring, we would have done a side-by-side -side feature for you where we set up a fire in a, in a typical living room, sprinkler and unsprinkler, and show you the comparison. So um, this is probably the next best thing, but it's very interesting. The fire we use, uh, we usually set a trash barrel fire uh, up against a curtain. And the fire development in this fire with a candle is almost identical to what we do in the side-by-side. Uh, and the other interesting thing is you're going to see that room become essentially untenable in when? About two minutes. So, Peg?
Thanks, Peg. So um, very dramatic video, and uh, you may not have picked up on it uh, in the in the audio, but um, there was an attempt. Uh, you can hear it in the background of somebody going to get it, a fire extinguisher. Uh, obviously, didn't know how to operate it. Don't know whether or not if whether or not it would even have been effective by the time they discovered it. Probably not. Uh, but they had trouble pulling the pin out. Uh, the gentleman, poor gentleman, uh, did suffer from dementia. He was he was moving toward the fire. You saw before uh, one of the family members members intervened to move him out of the room. So very dramatic uh, video footage and uh, we're grateful that the family allowed us to use it. And yes, the home was destroyed, uh, unfortunately. Um, so let's move on. Uh, we'll um, look at a little bit with the, uh, with the standard. So NFPA 13D um, is the installation standard for uh, one and two family dwellings. And basically uh, it takes the proven concept of sprinklers that have been around as the commissioner said for, uh, for a long time. Um, and tries to um, focus on the benefits in one or two family as a life safety system. So it only requires the sprinklers to be installed in living areas. So basically um, you don't have sprinklers in attic spaces, uh, small closets, small bathrooms. The standard does not uh, require sprinklers in garages, although um, some local communities in adopting the standard uh, have expanded uh, sprinklers protection in the garage space uh, with a, within attached garages. Um, but uh, as of today, that's not in the, in the standard. For years, um, when jurisdictions were trying to push for uh, sprinkler codes um, at the local level uh, and at the state level, um, there was always resistance, and as there is today still, from, from a lot of home builders. And um, sort of their mantra uh, to the advocates for sprinklers was, well, um, get it in the national model codes and then we'll be more uh, interested in having the discussion. Well, that took place more than a decade now in both the NFPA national model codes as well as the International Code Council, the ICC. So all the national model codes now require sprinklers in newly constructed one and two family dwellings. So now in the code promulgation process, what we have seen since then is except for California and Maryland at the state level, um, wherever it has come up in other places, it has either been amended out um, at the regulatory process um, or even, even more dramatic, um, there has been a legislative umbrella introduced um, preventing the promulgating body from even talking about residential sprinklers. Um, very unfortunate, uh, but that's where we are today and that's, uh, that's the reality. Some of the challenges that we have, a lack of awareness about, again, what residential sprinkler systems do, um, even up front about a lack of an appreciation for having a home fire, uh, that's, that's always the first step. Um, but, but then beyond that, you know, how residential sprinklers work and how they can uh, protect the home and what they do and what they don't, what they don't do. Uh, and again, as I talked before, the myths and misconceptions, the fact that people think um, they've been exposed to too many movies and TV shows where they all go off at once, or they're activated by smoke and uh, they've had challenges with their smoke alarm systems and experience with uh, going off from cooking um, or other nuisance issues, and they think they're going to have the same problem with fire, with, uh, fire sprinklers, or that they're costly in a, in a relatively term. Um, we know that the national average now is, um, is not much more than um, a dollar um, thirty per square foot. Um, we know in many places where it's been adopted for years, um, it, it actually runs below a dollar a square foot. Um, but in terms of the relative cost to the total construction project, um, it's very minimal in terms of the benefit that we see. Um, this is very new information. You are the first uh, people to put their eyes on this information. So we just recently did a survey focused um, at millennials, um, sort of the next generation of, of not only new home buyers, but new um, buyers of new homes, of new newly built homes. Um, so we wanted to get their perception about uh, fire safety awareness and then specifically about sprinklers. So we pulled out a few key findings. Uh, we'll be doing a, a more detailed press release about this uh, in the coming weeks, but uh, we wanted to pull out a couple of key facts that we thought you'd be interested in. <clears throat> so people that are moving from renting to, to buying uh, a new home, 80% of those in the next three years would prefer a home with sprinklers. 72% uh, um, believe sprinklers would add value to the home. And 68% of millennials thought living in a home with fire sprinklers more appeal appealing after reading this statement below that fires today burn faster and kill, kill quicker than they used to. A home fire now can become deadly in two minutes or less 
because our furniture and belongings are made of synthetics that create deadly smoke when they burn. So when they would read that statement, 68% um, that thought that living with homes with fire sprinklers was beneficial. So what this says out of these 2009 adults, millennial adults, is that um, as they start, start to think about um, building new homes, um, we want to make sure that they're aware about sprinklers and the importance and the value of them. But it really should say to developers and builders that this is an audience they should be targeting and that, um, that safety sells to this group. And um, sprinklers can be an important feature to be including uh, in a new home project. Um, other challenges with, with water purveyors, um, and again, um, in many jurisdictions where um, sprinklers have been limited to large industrial and commercial systems and there hasn't been a lot of experience uh, with supplying water to residential sprinklers, they don't understand the 13D system requirements and how um, much more um, simple they are, if you will, compared to industrial and commercial systems. Um, the backflow requirements in some areas can be challenging um, to if they are compared to residential sprinkler systems. There are certain water meters uh, that are used domestically that may not be compatible with a residential system or the way the piping requirement may be set up uh, makes it challenging um, in terms of supplying that sprinkler. And the concern about um, if we have a delinquent bill issue, uh, the water supply may have to be shut off to the home. Well, I mean, my philosophy on that is if that home water supply is shut off, that home is no longer inhabitable and the occupant is not gonna be there. Um, is the building now exposed because the sprinkler system has been turned off? Sure, but there's no one living there. Uh, and we know from most fire causes that, um, um, that the occupants are uh, involved in the cause of most home fires. And so therefore, again, the, the likelihood of fire occurring in an unoccupied home, if the sprinkler system had been shut off because of a, a delinquent bill issue is, is much less of a concern. Um, high tap fees can penalize um, homeowners too. Again, if the same type of uh, rules that are put in place and we can, <laughs> we can talk about the logic of some of these rules that relates to um, industrial and commercial systems, but if those same rules are applied to residential one and two family structures, um, it can penalize a homeowner with a, with a high bill or tap fee or maintenance fee, or even a, a standby fee at some times that's applied to commercial buildings. If that same logic and philosophy is applied to uh, residential, it can make it very challenging. Um, another piece of research that um, uh, the Home Fire Sprinkler Co Coalition did with um, FM Global. FM Global is a, is a large industrial and commercial insurer, but they were involved in the original development of the residential fire sprinkler, uh, the technology for the fire, residential fire sprinkler many years ago. Uh, and they worked with HFSC on looking at the environmental impact of fires. So basically what they did is a full scale um, living room setup, and they monitored all the environmental, important environmental factors in that fire sprinkled versus unsprinkled. <clears throat> and what they found was, uh, the study found was that the greenhouse gas emissions were reduced by 98%. The fire damage was reduced by up to 97%. So that can have a huge impact on reducing the waste and debris that goes into our landfills. Water usage is reduced by as much as 91%, uh, the sprinkled fire compared to the unsprinkled fire and the water pollution can be reduced. Um, that water runoff coming from a fully involved house fire, um, you know, we're, we're not usually seeing um, fire departments trying to capture the water runoff. Um, that's not, so, not something that's normally done, obviously. But if you measured the pollution coming off there and the contaminants coming in off there, um, it can have a huge difference compared to a controlled sprinkler fire with much less water and obviously much less water runoff. So again, the big question for us all, if we're looking at North Carolina, what do we do? Um, if the code right now as it exists today is, does not require uh, sprinklers in newly constructed one and two family homes, how can we work around the code, if you will? And how can we in, uh, provide incentives um, that get sprinklers in uh, basically on a voluntary basis through the development and planning process? And that's what we're going to look at. So uh, we're going to focus on nine different incentives, and it, these are not the, um, the end all for a list. There may be others that you could think of that we haven't covered. These are the ones that we have seen most often used all across the country. Um, they are lo locally negotiated, uh, meaning that the, uh, the, the, it's a partnership between the fire service 
and the planning and zoning um, people that are involved in, in um, producing the permit for that project to move forward. Um, it's different for every community. And again, not every one of these nine are applicable in every community, nor are they applicable in every single project. The key point is it does not require a change in the local code. We are not suggesting um, as part of this that, um, that this is a, a process that says, thou shalt sprinkle all new homes in a local community. Through the planning process, yes, it requires a little bit of effort now because we're talking about looking at every single development project individually. But if the code doesn't address it across the board, that's the way it has to be done. But what we're hoping to do by looking at these incentives is reduce construction costs for the developer and increase their profit. And we'll be upfront about that. We want the builder to be profitable, the developer to be profitable. But let's figure out a way in doing that, that we provide a safer community and a better project to protect the occupants and the fire service. So the first one is, uh, these first couple are all about um, uh, the infrastructure that's necessary uh, to um, handle fire department response. Um, so street width reduction, um, the idea that we can, if we have a sprinkler uh, development, uh, we could reduce the traffic lanes, um, reduce the amount of pavement used. Uh, and again, the philosophy is that we are not going to need the same level of emergency response in terms of total volume of fire equipment in, in that development uh, if we have a fully involved structure fire compared to one we expect to be controlled by sprinklers. Longer dead end streets. This one is very prop popular because most developments have restrictions uh, or zoning requirements or planning requirements have restrictions on the length of a dead end street. And um, we've seen this one used a lot where if the sprinklers are provided in all the homes in that development will increase, um, allow a increase in the length of a, uh, a dead end street. Um, to, uh, this allows usually additional building lots uh, to be accessed as part of that development. T turnarounds or hammerheads, um, again, uh, reducing the amount of uh, infrastructure from a pavement standpoint, instead of a large sweeping cul-de-sac that may be necessary for a turnaround. Uh, again, the philosophy is I'm gonna have less fire apparatus in the development uh, to handle any anticipated fire in that development. So a T turnaround or a hammerhead turnaround would be permittable. Increased grades and building setbacks. Again, this one is very popular uh, in terms of um, allowing that steeper grade, which normally we wouldn't uh, find accept, accept, acceptable for fire apparatus or a, a long driveway, a large setback. Um, if we have sprinklers, uh, we can now um, usually accept those uh, steeper grades and further setbacks from the road. Again, another very popular one, subdivision single access point. So uh, if we have a fully sprinkled subdivision, um, we've seen many developments uh, provide now for a single public access road. Um, obviously this one is not popular, not utilized in areas where uh, we have a large wildfire um, threat. And um, we get that, we understand that. And that's why I said earlier, not every one of these uh, incentives will be used everywhere, um, but where it can be used um, and it has been used a lot, um, this will save a huge amount of infrastructure costs and in not requiring that second access road and probably some extra build buildable lots as well. Um, additional units, higher density, and you say, okay, so, you know, density here, we're getting more into the issue of fire exposure externally. But again, um, even though NFK 13D is a life safety system, what, is it sh what it had sh shown over the last 40 years is that it certainly has provided a high degree of inherent property protection as well. California, this is how they rationalized their statewide requirement for sprinklers was on uh, maintaining a, or allowing a higher amount of density. Um, so increased or decreased, if you will, the spacing between each um, home in the development. Um, and again, allows homes to be built closer together, uh, more homes in that particular development. Um, really, this is one of my favorites. Um, expansion of the existing water supply may not be needed. So every development um, would have a required fire flow and fire flow comes from a calculation of basically um, it's, it's looking at what is the building occupied for and what is the size and out of that becomes a, a fire flow. It assumes the building is basically fully involved. 
Um, there are different flow calculations based on if you have a warehouse or manufacturing or, or a single family home. But even with a single family home, if we have sprinklers, we do not anticipate having to use that fire flow. So we have seen many developments approved for um, a fire flow calculation that basically equals the domestic demand. So the domestic demand basically can take care of the sprinkler demand. So you don't have to increase or provide for larger mains or an increased capacity in that development um, if it is fully sprinkled. Um, this, this one is a, is a huge benefit and I've seen this one used a lot. Increased hiding, hydrant spacing goes right along with that. Um, again, I don't expect to use the same number of hydrants uh, or need the same availability of hydrants in a fully sprinkled development. Most of the communities I've seen that have enacted this, basically they look at um, what is the typical amount of supply hose that's carried on their first two fire apparatus. So let's say if it's a thousand feet or 1200 feet of supply hose, they'll allow a thousand or 1200 feet between hydrants. And again, that'll save a huge amount of infrastructure costs and maintenance cost over the long term of that development. And gated communities. So again, gated naturally, even with if the fire department has keys or an access code, um, it still requires um, that to be utilized. So I'm going to have a, a little bit of a slower response, um, either to the whole development or to an individual property. But if it's sprinkled, I'm controlling that fire and I can, I can accept that delay that occurs in a gated community. So a couple of quick case studies um, in our homepage. Um, uh, we have uh, several of the, these that are shown, but here's a couple of that I wanted to highlight. Uh, the first one comes from Camas, uh, Washington. They started out with, a, with about a 60 home development there. And um, over the period of time, it has blossomed up to about 2000 homes. So, dur so during that time, um, the developer has seen huge infrastructure savings with the flexibility that occurred during, uh, during this project. Um, waived fees. And, and what that means is um, there were certain fees that were waived relative to the, um, uh, the plan review for the residential sprinklers. Um, there were other fees that were waived relative to uh, tap, main, tap fees for the mains for the residential sprinkler system that I talked about earlier. Uh, so that was a saving. They did allow single access point, um, increased density, street width reduction, longer dead end streets, uh, hydrant spacing and the gated community. So, um, I mean, this is almost like a greatest hits, if you will. And, and really it's a, uh, it's a classic example of, um, of how all these features can be used uh, to provide developer incentives and provide a better protected community uh, for the fire service and the occupants. And the next one is uh, very close to me. Um, um, it's right in my hometown. It's about five miles from where I'm sitting. Um, Massachusetts is a Minimax state. So um, where the building adopted fire and building code um, contains both the minimum provisions and the maximum provisions. So um, the jurisdictions cannot adopt anything more stringent uh, than what the state code requires. But despite this, we've had a number of communities where um, the fire departments and the planning boards have worked together and we've been able to, through the permitting process, get fire sprinklers installed. Um, a community north of Boston, North Andover, um, has close to 3,000 sprinklers um, installed, homes installed with sprinklers using this approach, which in a mini max state is huge. So the two projects in my town that I participated in the public hearings for, uh, one's called The Farm, one's called Pearl Road. Um, so again, uh, we, we set up for uh, incentives for a single access that was allowed. We had a much longer dead end road and we, um, we had hydrants spaced further apart. When the projects were first planned, um, this um, was one where area town had had a very poor water supply. Um, the town was going to be in the process of eventually improving that, uh, but the developer wanted to move ahead before that was going to happen. So sprinklers were another incentive because the available water supply as poor as it was could still meet the demand for the residential sprinklers. Eventually the water supply was proved, improved here, but um, one of the issue that also you can't change is the fact is um, this was the longest response time for the fire department, uh, close to a 10 minute response time uh, from the single station that we have in town. So providing sprinklers in these two, two developments uh, was a huge improvement in protection. 
Um, this last survey we did with an organization called Handley Wood, which is very active in the, um, the builder uh, market. Um, we wanted to look at sort of the, the, the gap in knowledge between um, the issue of our developers interested in sprinklers and whether or not the discussion has ever occurred during the, the planning process. So what this says is that 55% of the developers would be interested in protecting home with sprinklers if they were offered incentives. Now, maybe that to some sounds a little low, but uh, I think it's a step in the right direction. The problem is that only 9% um, were aware of the incentives that might be able to be um, utilized. So some of the ones that we've talked about today, only 9% were aware that these things could be done. And then from the AHJ side, only 6% had ever offered uh, these type of incentives during the planning process with developers. So we've got a big gap here, and that's you know something we're trying to uh, move the needle on by having programs um, such as this. And again, the most important incentives that they saw from a developer standpoint, obviously additional units, anytime the developer can gain a couple of building lots, that's an incentive. And then not requiring the expansion of the existing water supply, which again, um, you know, that's one of my favorites from a fire protection standpoint as well. If I can get better protection without expanding the water supply, I'm, I'm all for that too. Okay, so um, I'm gonna turn the program now over to Charlie Johnson and uh, Charlie, you can uh, take, the, uh, take our attendees through uh, what's going on in North Carolina. Thank you, Gary. And thank all of you that are participating in this webinar this morning. We're certainly glad that you decided to join in this morning and we do wanna talk about some of the um, some of the code tie-ins to what Gary just mentioned with those incentives and how you can go about utilizing some of these locally. And I also want to close um, telling you about an effort through the North Carolina Fire Marshals Association uh, where we're going to be looking at some of the requirements that tie sprinklers directly to development of subdivisions. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. So the commissioner this morning, uh, when he started off, he gave you some information about some of the fire deaths in North Carolina, uh, the 138 back a couple of years ago, 117 last year, and that 101 year to date, I understand is 102 now because we recently had um, uh, uh, another fatality uh, in the mountains. So I, I'm not sure how many of you um, subscribe to the daily uh, dispatch, but that is a, a, a newsletter that I get every day uh, that gives the North Carolina uh, highlights on fires and then gives uh, a national perspective on fires, uh, big events that are going on. And it just, it was odd to me, I, a couple of days ago, I received one, the North Carolina version of it, and I want to share it with you, uh, why we're so passionate about getting fire sprinklers and in homes in North Carolina. <clears throat> there were three articles. The first one, Infa dies in Haywood County Fire. Uh, commissioner spoke about that earlier, two month old. Uh, the remainder of the family was fortunately able to get out, but uh, the two month old succumbed to the, to the fire. Dog dies in Apex. Um, and then the last one was Fayetteville Home Destroyed. So, when you combine those three, you see that there was a loss of life, uh, human loss of life, pets, which are family to us, and obviously the structural damage that occurred from someone losing a home because of fire. So when you look at those three combined, that gives you some perspective of why we're, again, so passionate about fire and why we're so passionate about getting residential sprinklers installed in homes because, as the slide illustrates, fire is everyone's fight. I do want to take just a minute, um, and you can do the, the, the research on this, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, several years ago, January 1986, uh, proposed uh, an ordinance or adopted a local ordinance. And recently, there was a, a review of that ordinance and what kind of impact that ordinance had on that community. And that 15 year study revealed that more than 50% of the homes in that city are protected with fire sprinkler systems. And of those, no fire deaths occurred in those sprinkler homes. However, 13 deaths in homes without sprinklers. So 
we feel like and we know that um, there's there's opposition to putting uh, code requirements in place that mandates fire sprinklers in every home in North Carolina. Uh, the model codes, as Gary mentioned, clearly do, uh, but we feel it's important um, to discuss the benefits of having home fire sprinklers. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about the, the code in North Carolina, but a couple of things before we get to that. One is I want to challenge the fire service participants that are on this webinar to get involved, if you're not already, with your subdivision development process. Work with your local planning uh, and zoning staff. Uh, get involved with a development review process. Most jurisdictions have something in place uh, that allows uh, various entities to become involved to see what kind of impact that development has. I was fortunate enough to be involved with that in Wake County um, where the Board of Education was involved, planning, uh, fire service was involved, EMS. There were a lot of uh, stakeholders that were brought to the table to see what kind of impact subdivision development was going to have and how we could address those items. So work with those local planners. Again, I'm challenging your work with those to review your development ordinances. If you have UDOs or unified development ordinances in your jurisdiction, compare those to what some of these code requirements are we're going to be talking about in just a few minutes. One, uh, if I'm sorry, Peg, if you'll back up, the street widths is a common one, public and private. Generally, you're going to have a different street width allowed for private as opposed to what you're allowed for public. The code may conflict with that. So you wanna look at that, your grade and setbacks, multiple access roads, when are they required? And are there any special requirements for uh, gated communities? But for these things to work, and Gary went through those nine incentives that have worked throughout other parts of the country, there must be give and take uh, from all parties to make these incentives work. And that's what we wanna, put for you this morning is is how these can be beneficial in your local community. And again, they don't all fit for every community, but it's something to consider. So as we talk about the code and how it applies, 102.5 of the North Carolina code clearly states that when you build a home in North Carolina, and this is consistent throughout the country, the International Residential Code or North Carolina Residential Code as we know it here uh, applies to the construction of that dwelling. However, the development must meet the requirements of the North Carolina Fire Code to include these three items that I've identified. We're not going to talk much about premise identification, but there are two, the fire apparatus access roads and water supplies. I do want to spend a little bit of time on that. Uh, so you guys understand how the code ties into the development and why it's so important for you to be involved on the front end to make sure, number one, you have adequate access and you have adequate water supply. Where those lack, then residential sprinklers could be an option to offset some of the requirements. So the first thing I want to mention, Chapter 5 of the North Carolina Fire Code contains those three items that we just talked about. It, 503, Section 503, uh, provides you requirements for fire apparatus access roads. 505 is where you'll find premise identification requirements, street signs, addressing. And 507 is where you'll find the water supply requirements. These three sections are required uh, for residential subdivision development in North Carolina. The appendices that you see at the bottom of the slide, Appendix B, C, and D is what we want to focus on a little bit this morning. These are all optional based on the way we've adopted our code in North Carolina. So the thought process was when these appendices were put in the international codes, these were given additional requirements and local jurisdictions could look at these appendices and determine if there was a benefit for local adoption. So if you have a scenario, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in just a minute, but Appendix B for an example, 
provide you an option for fire flow calculations in a building. So if a local jurisdiction wanted to adopt this, this practice in Appendix B for using it to determine fire flow requirements, they would have to adopt that through their local fire ordinance, and that ordinance would have to be approved by the Building Code Council. So you do have requirements listed in Chapter 5, but you also have these appendices in the back of the book. And we're going to talk about the impact these appendices are having throughout the state of North Carolina. So let's look at, at Chapter 5. Let's talk about the requirements first. So the 503 clearly states that the code official is authorized to require more than one access road for a subdivision development, when it could be potentially impaired by uh, vehicle congestion, uh, terrain may be an issue, uh, or other factors. Um, so that is really a performance-based requirement, though, and that is tied to the code official to make that decision on whether or not they're going to require multiple means of ingress and egress for a subdivision development. There's not a prescriptive requirement here that's tied to a number of lots, as you will see in Appendix D a little bit later on. So when you're looking at trying to make this decision, and this is what one of the issues that's been problematic throughout the state, and Brian talked about it at the very beginning, some of the legislative inquiries that we've had have been focused on this. You have one county, uh, fire inspector that's doing a plan review uh, and they're requiring multiple means of egress for a subdivision with 45 homes. You have this same developer goes to an adjacent county and builds 75 homes in a development and there's no mention of a second means of ingress or egress. So that filters up to local legislators and they're contacting us saying, wait a minute, why am I able to build 45 in one county and I'm being asked to put two roads in and I build 75 in another one and not have to put two roads in? So we're going to talk about a strategy that we're going to be using to try to address this in a little bit. But this could be beneficial uh, as one of the items that Gary mentioned earlier in the incentives uh, to give code officials the option to allow single point of ingress and egress uh, for fire apparatus uh, provided to homes of sprinklers. So if you get into some of those larger developments, it, it's critical to have access for emergency vehicles. <clears throat> so the next item that's required is water supply. Gary also touched on this. The code requires that you establish a water supply that provides the required fire flow for fire protection. And that water supply could be a number of sources. Could be from a lake or reservoir, pressure tank, elevated tank. Could be water mains and hydrants if they're provided. Or it could be other fixed systems capable of providing the required fire flow. So when we look at access being the first component that's required, now we look at water supplies required, clearly. If we have a fire in homes, we want to make sure that we have adequate access, and we also want to make sure that we have adequate water supply to sustain fire operations uh, in the event a fire occurs in a single family dwelling. <clears throat> so, in some cases, you may have fire departments that have to shuttle the water uh, from point A to point B. So, Throughout North Carolina, there are a lot of locations that do not have hydrants installed throughout. So in those situations, these fire departments are required to go to a static water source somewhere and fill these tanker trucks up that come back and dump water into these portable drop tanks that then the water is pumped out and used to suppress the fire. The issue with this is Obviously, the travel time, the remoteness of the water supply source, what the capabilities of the fire department are to deliver it, and can it be sustained for a given period of time uh, to make sure that that fire can be adequately suppressed um, in a timely manner. So 
Uh, this is an option that's used in a lot of locations throughout the state of North Carolina uh, where you do not have hydrants and water mains installed. <clears throat> so when you look at the fire flow requirements, our code gives us an option and the 2018 code uh, changed, this section changed somewhat in the 28 code by providing a couple of other options. Um, Previous to 2018, this section just simply said that the fire flow requirements uh, were established based on a needed fire flow. The 2018 code was modified to give you some options. You have the ISO rating schedule. You have NFPA 1142, which is an example, which is typically used in rural areas where you do not have water supply uh, and in most cases, a thousand gallons a minute is really all you're going to be requiring uh, because it's in a rural setting. Or the code now says, or other approved methods. And one of those is Appendix B, which is contained in the code, somewhat modeled after the ISO uh, requirements, but it is somewhat different. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. <clears throat> So as an example, if you look at the, the latest ISO calculation guide for one and two family dwellings that are not exceeding two stories in height, this is the fire flow calculations for a duration of one hour. So if you have a subdivision being built, you have homes that are spaced more than 30 feet apart, 500 gallons a minute is the needed fire flow. In a lot of cases, your rural fire department operations can probably sustain up to 500 gallons a minute by shuttling water from point A to point B. But when you start moving these homes closer together and you start increasing that GPM requirement, it makes it that much more difficult if there's not an on-site water source such as a hydrant. But one thing I wanna focus on in that last slide is it's up to the local jurisdiction to select which one of those um, options they're gonna use to calculate the needed fire flow. So throughout it, North Carolina, when you develop a subdivision, there should be a needed fire flow established for that development based on the homes that are being built within that development. You can use again ISO, can use Appendix B, 1142, there are several others out there, uh, but you've got to decide locally which one of these you're going to use to, do, to establish that needed fire flow. All right, so here's where we get into some challenges to what we're doing, and this is the local adoption of these appendices. And our code 101.2.1 says that the provisions of those appendices are not enforceable unless they're specifically adopted in a local ordinance and subsequently approved by the Building Code Council. So June 1st, 2012 is when that modification was made. So if you have a local fire ordinance that has been adopted that includes any of these appendices, if it was adopted after June 1st, 2012, it's not locally enforceable without that Building Code Council approval. So I want you guys that um, there have been some ordinances in North Carolina that were clearly established prior to that date, um, and this doesn't affect you. But I have had several calls this week from fire chiefs uh, inquiring about Appendix D and fire apparatus access roads, uh, and we're going to talk about a little bit of that as we go on. But I wanted you to be aware that if you decide locally that you want to use Appendix B for your fire flow calculations or Appendix D to provide additional requirements on your fire apparatus access roads, those local ordinances must be approved by your county commissioners or town council, city council, and then submitted to us so we can get it on the agenda for the building code council to approve it as well. <clears throat> so when you look at the required fire flow calculations in appendix B, it is somewhat different than that calculation I showed you earlier from ISO. So the fire flow calculation here is if you have homes that are less than 3,600 square feet, 
there's no sprinkler system, then the expectation is you have a minimum fire flow of 1,000 gallons a minute for a duration of one hour. So when you start looking at the water supply availability, if you have municipal mains and you have hydrants within those subdivisions, you may be able to meet that requirement. But where you don't have that permanent water source, then the expectation is you're going to have to provide some water source to provide that requirement. Now, if you notice down at the bottom of that table, if you're building less than 3,600 square feet, and you sprinkle these in accordance with that NFPA 13D standard that Gary spoke of, or P2904 of the residential code, then you cut that minimum fire flow down to 500 gallons a minute for 30 minutes, which is a huge reduction. But as you'll see in a little bit, uh, if you adopt Appendix B, then generally the expectation is you go with the sprinkler demand at the riser or the fire flow calculation, whichever is great. <clears throat> so one that we have received an awful lot of calls on, Gary mentioned this earlier. D107.1 says that if you have a subdivision development, and there are more than 30 dwelling units, then you should have, or you're required to have, two separate fire apparatus access roads. Um, now, again, this is contingent upon you adopting Appendix D through your local ordinance and having it approved by the Building Code Council. If you don't have it approved and it's not adopted by council, it's not legally enforceable. You can certainly use it as a guide, but if the developer says, I'm not doing it, then you don't have a, a mandatory requirement in place to make that happen. So we're getting a lot of calls about, is that 30 a little bit too restrictive? Should it be 50? Should it be 80? Should it be 100? There is an exception. Uh, that allows for more than 30 homes on a single access road if sprinklers are installed. So it ties back into one of those incentives. Uh, if you have an adopted Appendix D and you would have a scenario where you would love to have two ways in and out, uh, but you don't have the legal means to make it happen, then obviously sprinklers is a trade-off that gives you that ability. The second requirement in this section is that they must be remotely located. So when you take the property as a whole and uh, generally one half the diagonal of the greatest distance, uh, those roads, if you're required to have two, must be that far apart. So <clears throat> I know this is the last slide, but I do want to make you aware of, of, of something that we're trying to do uh, through the North Carolina Fire Marshals Association uh, to address some concerns that have been escalated up to us, uh, primarily through uh, a legislative house select committee uh, back last spring. There was a concern about residential development in North Carolina and why there were so many difficulties with and why there were so many dis discrepancies from one jurisdiction to another. And two things that were highlighted by this committee, one was uh, the number of access points into a subdivision, and the second one was fire flow, needed fire flow. So through the North Carolina Fire Marshals Association, we've established an appendix ad hoc committee. That ad hoc committee has had one meeting. We sent out a survey a couple of weeks ago, and we've asked all fire code jurisdictions throughout North Carolina to provide us a response to that survey by December the 4th. And some of the questions that we want to know is, have you adopted the appendices? If so, which ones? Um, do you have requirements built into unified development ordinance that address some of these similar issues. So we want to kind of gauge what's happening throughout North Carolina. Here's the primary purpose for why we're doing this. Again, I gave you the example earlier that you may have a local jurisdiction that adopts an appendix and they're requiring 
two means of ingress and egress when they build more than 30 homes. Well, that adjacent county could go in and build 200 homes, and they don't have this ordinance adopted. There's not a legal requirement for them to require two ways in and out. So we're getting hit with that question. Why can I build 200 homes here and have a single point of entry and I build 35 here and I've got to have two? So one of the things that this committee is going to be challenged with once we get the survey results back in is looking at the language that's contained primarily in appendix B, C, and D. And we're going to try to determine, is there an opportunity for us to evaluate these requirements? This 30 is a good example. And should we codify this language in the body of Chapter 5, where it's a requirement throughout the state of North Carolina? So as a committee, and again, I'm going to keep alluding to this 30 because this is a hot topic right now. The committee may decide that it's more appropriate to bump that number up to 50. The committee could decide to leave the number at 30. But then we will decide, should we put this in as a requirement in Chapter 5 so that every jurisdiction in North Carolina is then singing off the same sheet of music? If that happens, then I think we'll get better consistency throughout the state. So that's the challenge of that ad hoc committee is to look at fire flow calculations and to look at fire apparatus access roads and determine if there's a way that we can consistently enforce these requirements throughout the state. It may be difficult, but I think it's worth the uh, I think it's worth the uh, the effort that we're going to put forth to do this. Otherwise, we could have a scenario where um, we run the risk of, of, of having sections removed from the code that eliminates our ability to address this even on a local level. So um, we, we are going to be uh, looking at this. Um, so uh, again, I appreciate your opportunity being uh, a part of the webinar this morning. I hope uh, it's been beneficial to you. Hope you've got something out of it. And I think we're going to go into a, a Q and A session now. Thanks, Charlie, and thanks, Gary, for, for your presentations. We are going to move to the Q&A section, and uh, Kelly Ransdell, and I certainly want to thank Kelly for the work that she does um, on behalf of NFPA in North Carolina and a whole bunch of other places. Um, Kelly's been the, uh, moderating the Q&A, and I know we've got a few, so I'll turn it over to Kelly. And if you have additional questions, continue to put them in the Q&A section, and uh, we'll address as many as we can. So, Kelly? Thanks, Lorraine. And we're going to have all our panelists to come back up so that you can see their faces and we'll kind of separate this out. Um, there was one comment that I wanted to share with the group and this was shared by Jeff Johnson and he says our land development ordinance requires two points of access for greater than 100 residential units. So as Charlie said, there is some variance by ordinance. Um, the first question for the group is how can I apply this incentive concept locally if adopted and enforced codes don't speak to these issues? So Gary and Charlie, I'll turn that one over to you. Well, I can address some of that. Um, the North Carolina Administrative Code, uh, Section 105, uh, Alternate Materials and Methods is frequently used um, to give local code officials the ability to accept an alternate material or method uh, if it's determined to be equivalent in safety. Um, and I can tell you, this is a section that's used throughout the code on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, not only as it relates to items that we're talking about here this morning, but construction features as well. So if a local jurisdiction is interested in these incentives, then I would certainly suggest approaching it from an alternate materials and method in section 105 of the admin code as an angle to get you that opportunity. Gary, you may have something else you want to add. Yeah, and again, I, I, I just want to speak to it sort of generically, if you will. So again, I'll take my own personal experience in my hometown here as an example. For those two projects, it wasn't even a, addressed as a code issue. It was just through um, the planning board. So the fire chief supported the the issue, 
Um, the planning board chairman supported the moving forward with sprinklers. So at the two public hearings, uh, the fire chief didn't even attend. Um, I can debate whether or not that was right or wrong. He had had communication with the planning board chairman in advance. He was supportive of it. But at the hearing, it was it was a back and forth between the developer and the planning board. Um, you know, if I do sprinklers from the developer standpoint, if I do sprinklers, you know, what 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 can I what can I get from that? And that's how we ended up with those things that I mentioned earlier in the case study. So it was never a code issue at all. It was strictly part of the planning process. And this is really because again, because we're in a minimax state, that's exactly what it's had to have. That's exactly what had to occur in all these projects across the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But once the decision is made through the planning board, they issue it as part of their special permit that says this project is going forward with 27 new homes, all homes shall be sprinkled. At that point now, it becomes a code issue now because the system has to be installed according to NFPA 13D. The building code then takes over and says, okay, this project is going to be sprinkled. 13D is now mandated as the standard that it, that it has to be installed to. So, um, but up to that point, it's strictly a planning process, not a code process. All right, now the next one, and I'm gonna call in Brian to this one as well because it speaks to ISO, but I think Gary, um, you and Charlie can also weigh in on this one. How do the incentives affect the ISO ratings? Yeah, let me just answer it again from a historical standpoint because uh, Charlie mentioned Scottsdale in his, in his slides and Scottsdale did battle with ISO. And I guess, um, I don't know, that's the insurance service organization. I just to reinforce that for the non-fire folks. Um, and they do the ratings of the fire departments in the communities. Um, because at the time in 1986, when they moved forward with their ordinance, um, ISO didn't even dress um, residential sprinklers. Uh, you, you could do, you could sprinkler every new development as Scottsdale was doing. And when ISO came in, they basically put the blinders on and didn't care. And all the fire flow calculations and response calculations had uh, basically ignored the fact that the property was sprinkled. So fast forward now, the, at least the schedule has been updated to include um, at least allowing different parameters to be looked at as a result of the sprinklers being included, which I think is a step in the positive, a step in the positive direction. Uh, this is Brian. I believe we're still behind times because what we're seeing a lot of times is that uh, they're not giving it. Uh, they're, they're looking that it's um, the water damage from it. We, we still have to educate the insurance industry here uh, unless Charlie has heard anything any different from my time being here in Raleigh, that's what uh, we have heard um, that they are not given, given the incentives. They're looking at the fire department response and hydrant placement uh, in those areas. Charlie, anything to add on that, sir? Not really. Uh, the coalition, uh, we have had some discussion uh, about you know, pre-COVID, we were engaged in a lot of discussions about the fire sprinkler industry in North Carolina. And one was, you know, reaching out to the insurance industry to figure out what those benefits were. Generally, if you get a safety break from insurance companies on your homeowners, um, it, it's a widespread. I mean, you either get it or you don't. So if you have smoke alarms, in other words, you get the break just like you would if you have smoke alarms and sprinkler, it breaks the same. So we feel like there should be an improved break or an increased break if you install residential fire sprinklers, but uh, that's a conversation that we'll, that we'll have to have later on. So I'll let Lorraine weigh in on the insurance side of things as well. <laughs> one of the challenges we found <clears throat> is that State Farm is the one that sits on the Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition nationally um, representing that industry and they do kind of standardize it just didn't make it down to their agent level that there were discounts but other carriers um, are not able to do that for example at our house since we have a security system you would get the same discount as you would for adding sprinklers which is completely different I mean in that aspect but Lorraine any movement on that nationally you want to discuss before we move yeah, on and, and I would just say that the insurance issue is a huge challenge for us on the home fire sprinkler side. We do, we are at a point where the majority of the insurance carriers do offer a, some kind of discount for people that have home fire sprinklers, but that doesn't always trickle, trickle down to the, the agent level. 
Um, so it is a huge awareness issue and education issue all across the board, um, because I will say as well that one of the biggest questions we get all the time is where is the insurance industry around home fire sprinklers? So um, part of our work with the Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition is educating those insurance companies on, on to the value of sprinklers and how we can work better together uh, to pass that on to homeowners. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and Kelly, let me just add, um, you know, Lorraine's right that, you know, all the, all the nationals that we're aware of offer some discount now that they didn't 30 years ago. But um, I think all of them are asking it that it be monitored, um, which I think from their standpoint, you know, because they are concerned, as Brian said, about the water damage that they do want to see the system monitored, I get that. Um, so I got a discount, but um, I, I just added a zone on my security system with water flow and and they were satisfied with that. So I, I, I think that's to be understood. Thank you. All right, the next one uh, for Gary and Charlie would be, wouldn't a uniform adoption of Appendix D standardize the requirements for the number of required access roads? So Charlie? And I'm, I'm sorry, can you ask that again? Yeah, so the question was, would a uniform adoption of Appendix D standardize the requirements for the number of required access rates? That, that is one of the items that the appendix ad hoc committee is looking at is to determine what elements or what requirements in appendix D should be codified. Should we look at mandating a certain number of homes to have two ways in and out? Should we look at requiring street widths to be a certain width if the dead end is, I mean, there's a lot of discussions that we're gonna have going forward. Um, but I think the one that's getting the most attention right now is the two ways in and out, because quite honestly, a 30 home subdivision is not a large subdivision. And in a lot of cases, DOT is gonna come back and say, because of the, 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 how small that subdivision is, we're not gonna let you put two access roads in, or maybe they don't have the ability to put the second access road in because there's a river that runs behind it. Um, so there are situations where I think we clearly need to be flexible. And I think that's one reason those requirements are contained in the appendix, uh, rather than being codified initially, was to allow some of that flexibility at the local level. But I think it's become such a point throughout the state that we're going to have to determine should there be a minimum and, and codify that and maybe still allow some local option on certain things. But that is the work of the committee. And hopefully once we get the survey results back in December, um, we do have a meeting scheduled for Friday um, to uh, discuss what we think we'll you know, get back from that. But uh, that's, that's going to be work of the committee. Uh, anything, Gary, to add to that? Um, only uh, I'll just say that, you know, I, I think the minimum always makes it easier, but, um, you know, sometimes a phrase that's used is performance based. And I think some of these incentives we've talked about, even if there's a minimum requirement in the code on any particular project, there's always a discussion that can be had from a performance based standpoint based on, on the layout that I've given in the terrain and, and everything else that goes on in the planning process and decide whether or not Again, if, if sprinklers are provided, you know, can we sharpen our pencil a little bit and look at something you know, less than the minimum as a result of that? My only concern in all these discussions with incentives is one fire chief said to me, he said, my community's already given away these things and we're not getting sprinklers. So um, <laughs> we need to be careful about that too. All right, the next question. Is there a general recommendation on how narrow a local street can be under an incentive type scenario. Road width can be a point of contention between the planners, the stormwater engineers and fire officials. And it seems this could be a way to get a mutually agreeable width. Any comments on that? Well, I'll, I'll start and then Gary may have some additional. When we look at the 20 foot requirement that's in the code, uh, the idea behind that 20 was simultaneous ingress and egress of apparatus. So you provide 10 in, 10 out. Um, I have had discussions with numerous code officials that a reduction in that 20 foot width is, is reasonable if someone's willing to go in and sprinkle these homes. Uh, because number one, you're not gonna have the need for simultaneous ingress and egress of apparatus. 
to answer the question specifically, I, you know, I think if you look, and that's why I mentioned earlier about the, the private road standards versus the public road standards, in a lot of cases, your private roads are 16 feet, where your public roads may be 20 feet. So, uh, but when you look at the code requirements, the code doesn't vary. The code says 20 feet minimum, uh, unless you locally allow the, the Department of Transportation subdivision requirements to be put in place, which could take that road width down to 18 feet. But clearly, if they have homes in a subdivision that are sprinkled throughout, uh, there's clearly not a need to have a 20-foot access roadway. So when you're looking at impervious surface restrictions, that certainly could come into play and be a benefit when you start looking at negotiating uh, lesser width. Gary, anything to follow up on that, sir? Nope. Charlie nailed it perfectly. Okay. Um, I would just tell you that one of the things we hear, I had a outreach from Texas and the fire chief, a fire chief there said, we've kind of give away the cow and, and the milk at one time. And they reduced the amount of distance between houses down from five feet to three feet. And now they're saying we got major problems since we did this. And so I think your point is right, Charlie, when people say they gave away the, the cow and the milk, and now they're trying to reel it back in. It's a real problem to get ahead of because once the genie's out of the bottle, it's really hard to, to go back to where you can have some protections. And you know, one of the things that we say is adopt the code as as a holistic document, it's a minimum standard. And Gary is notorious for saying substandard housing. You know, that's a minimum, the, the most minimum way you can build to. And when we're amending out things, the problems that follow it are just so, so rampant. So the next uh, question. One, before we move on, one point I want to make um, is, and I want to kind of direct this to code officials that are on the call. Um, the, the code certainly is a minimum, and a lot of folks look at the code and they establish that as the base point. I, I want to challenge you to be flexible and, and, and negotiate, and don't be afraid to give away a little bit. I mentioned the give and take earlier. Don't be afraid to be flexible when you have something such as residential fire sprinklers. If you have a developer that comes in and says, I'm gonna sprinkle all the homes in this subdivision if you'll work with me on A, B, C, and D. My challenge to you is go to the table and be negotiable. Don't be hard and steadfast that everything in the code is what you have to meet as a minimum. Be willing to bend uh, where you can. All right, so the next question is, could someone speak to the process to submit to the Building Code Council approval to adopt the appendices? Yes, we um, actually have one on the agenda that's coming up at the December meeting and I have two uh, sitting on my desk now that probably will be processed at the March meeting. Uh, <clears throat> if you're gonna adopt appendices locally, First step is you have to adopt those appendices uh, through your local uh, governmental entity. So through county commissioners, city or town council, you have to adopt it in your ordinance. Then you submit that ordinance along with their approval to me, uh, and then we will get it on the agenda for the building code council. I would invite you, if you're considering doing this, Send me, before you get it approved locally, what you want to do locally, what you want to change, what you want to adopt, and let me make sure there's not going to be any conflicts before you get it adopted locally. Because once you adopt it locally and send it to us, if the Building Code Council has issues with it, you may have to go back and modify your code. So reach out to me, um, share your thoughts on what you want to adopt, locally and I'll make a determination on whether or not it's problematic and give you guidance to go forward. If you get it adopted locally, we don't have any issues, then it's generally a seamless process when it goes to the board uh, or to the council. They will generally approve the local ordinance as long as it's not providing any conflict. All right, Charlie, for some clarification, um, there was a question that said, this is only if you didn't have a local ordinance prior to 2012, correct? 
the issue was the, the, the council changed the code in 2012 that mandated if you adopt a local fire prevention ordinance, that ordinance, or if you adopt any appendices, that ordinance must be submitted to the building code council for approval. So if you adopted appendices or you adopted a fire ordinance prior to June 2012, there was not a requirement for the building code council to approve the appendix adoption. There was a requirement for them to approve the ordinance. Um, after June of 2012, if you adopt the appendices locally, you must also get building code council approval. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, one additional question came in and it's kind of a statement, but also a point that if you and Gary can, can weigh in on the challenge with reducing the road width is that if the development allows for on-street parking or not. On-street parking, of course, can significantly impact access if the width is reduced. Not sure if this is being considered during the committee discussions. So Charlie, how about, is that being considered? Well, I guess the easiest way to answer that question is all things are being considered. The committee just met one time to develop the survey questions. So we sent the survey questions out. The real work is going to begin when we get those survey results back in. That's when we're going to roll the sleeves up, go to work, try to figure out what we need to do to provide some consistency across the state. Um, so yes, all things are being considered. On-street parking is a, is a big issue. Uh, there are jurisdictions that have gone in and put requirements in to restrict on-street parking or put signage in place. But yes, we will be considering all of that. Uh, but again, the benefits of having every home in a subdivision sprinkler uh, certainly outweighs somebody being able to park on the street. So we, we will be looking at all of the aspects that are contained within primarily Appendix D, but we're also going to be looking at C and B as well. Gary, anything to follow up on that, sir, that y'all have seen in these high density areas? Yeah, most of the places, Kelly, that I've seen that have done um, street width reduction have have put street uh, on street parking as part of the discussion. So they've either made their calculation based on assumption that it included on street parking if there was going to be that or they've set up a restriction either no on street parking or restricted it to one side of the street all right thank you so much thank you for the questions that were submitted and with that i'll turn it over to lorraine thanks kelly yeah those are some great questions and thank you all for being with us today i want to again thank chief taylor and commissioner Causey for their leadership in north carolina and thank you charlie for the work that you do around sprinklers we we are proud to work with you. Uh, so again, thank you for all being with us today. Uh, complete the survey evaluation. I know Lisa has put that in the chat. For those that are you from Wake, Harnett, and Chatham County, we'll send you the $10 gift certificate for lunch. If you have any questions after today, you can see that on, today, on the slide right here. Uh, you can email info at homefiresprinkler.org. You can also visit homefiresprinkler.org slash CRR for a lot more details on the information that was presented today. And I know we put those links in the chat as well. So thank you for being with us today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Lisa. Did you stop recording?